Today's scripture reading is from the book of Luke. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and, so, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them and out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop, a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables, so that those seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. This is the word of the Lord. For our district uh, superintendent, uh, Reverend uh, Mark Peters, uh, Pastor Peters is the uh, district su superintendent of the uh, Pacific District. So you can uh, see him like the, uh, the premier of BC, uh, and he's the premier of all the Alliance churches in uh, the Pacific District. Uh, so some, somebody very important, obviously. Um, Pastor Peters has been involved in pastoral ministry for 23 years uh, and serving on the staff team at the First Alliance Church in Calgary and then uh, as lead pastor at North Saw Alliance um, Church for 13 years. Um, pastor Mark is passionate about scripture and theology. He is particularly interested in the intersection between Christ and culture. So I hand over the time to Pastor Peter. Good morning, everyone. Just want to say thank you to Pastor Norman for the honor of, of preaching to you this morning. So I do serve as the district superintendent, and I, I, I think the only um, the only thing that makes me like the Premier of BC is I am elected, I suppose. And people are regularly disappointed in me. And so I have that in common with the Premier of BC, but it is, it's, a, it's a tremendous privilege to have the opportunity to connect with congregations and elders boards and pastors all across our, our wonderful province. No two churches that I visit are the same, but in every church I go to, what I encounter that is the same is the presence of Christ among his people. And today has been no different. Thank you for leading us in worship this morning. It, it has been wonderful to sense Christ's presence in our midst. And so the text I'm going to be preaching on this morning has already been read for us. Thank you. But before I get into an explanation of the text, I want to briefly introduce you to the subject of my sermon, namely the heart. Now, 
unless you are working in the medical field or if perhaps you are a cardiac patient, then you probably think a lot about the human heart. But otherwise, most of us don't pay much attention. The average human heart could fit in the palm of one's hand and it does more work than any other muscle in the entire body. Did you know that in the average lifetime, your heart will beat 2.5 billion times? Did you know that over the course of your lifetime, your heart will pump 1 million barrels of blood? which is enough to fill more than three super tankers that you might see in the Vancouver Harbor. The heart starts beating only four weeks after conception. Now, we know so much more about the physiology of the human heart than any of the ancient scriptural writers, and yet there are things that they knew about the heart that many in our day and time have forgotten. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, the Lord does not look at things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In Proverbs 4, 23, King Solomon wrote, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And in Luke 6, 45, Jesus said, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of which is to say our words reveal what's really in our heart. Our actions reveal what's in our heart. What we pursue reveals what's in our heart. And Jesus over and over again told those who were listening that what's inside a person is always going to come out. It's just a matter of time. Statistics Canada tells us that heart disease is the second leading cause of death in our nation. The Bible tells us that a diseased heart is the single greatest cause of a fruitless life. And so in Luke chapter 8, Jesus told a story to describe the kind of work that he was doing in his earthly ministry. He's like a farmer who goes out and scatters seed. The seed is God's word. The soil is the human heart. In farming, as all of us know, some soil is more fruitful than others. And the same is true of the human heart. And so this morning, I want to turn your attention to Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. I'm not going to read it again, but I want to say that Luke has deliberately placed this parable where it stands. If you read through the entire book of Luke, you will notice that the, the chapters surrounding Luke chapter 8, what we see is Jesus scattering seed through his preaching ministry, through his miracles. And as people interacted with what Jesus was saying and doing, the response of the crowd revealed the condition of their hearts. At times hard, very hard. They heard but didn't listen. They refused and rejected. At times, fragile. People grabbed a hold of the word with great joy, but then fell away. Some people has what Jesus described as a thorn-infested heart. But we also discover fertile soil or receptive hearts in unlikely people, tax collectors, a sinful woman, a Roman centurion. These are people who listen to what Jesus is saying, grab a hold of the word, and as a result, their lives are transformed. And so this morning, I want to walk through each of the four responses to Jesus. And as I do, can I ask you to pay attention to, to the condition of your own heart? So in verses 5 and 12, Jesus addresses the hard heart. These are people who hear his invitation, but ultimately refuse to listen. And this stubborn refusal, we are told, is augmented by the work of the evil one. So in John chapter 10, verse 10, we discover that while Jesus came to bring life, the work of the evil one is to steal, kill, and destroy. The question is, how does the evil one steal the word that Jesus seeks to implant? I want to suggest that the evil one's voice is so subtle that often we would swear we were listening to our own voice. 
let me offer an example. So when Jesus invites you to receive the love of the Father and the subsequent thought comes to mind, I'm not good enough. God would never forgive anyone like me. I want to suggest that the evil one is at work seeking to steal this word before it can become planted and lead to transformation. Think for a moment about the farmer in the story that Jesus told and how he goes about scattering seed. Is it just me or does he appear more than a little reckless? Because only a fool or a person with unlimited seed would scatter seed where it's impossible to grow in rocky, trampled down places. It's too much of a long shot. But Jesus can see what none of us can. He can see a willing heart, even in the life of a person that we might think is unable to respond to the call of Jesus. In the first three verses of our text, Jesus offers a description that tells us something really, really important about him and the kind of ministry he's engaged in. I I want to read it for us. Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him and also some women. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. And so as you look at the composition of Jesus' first group of followers, we see fishermen and zealots and tax collectors sitting alongside women. Now, Jesus was born into a time in history that was dominated by patriarchy. In the ancient world, women were minimally educated and given very little freedom. Ancient philosophers like Aristotle spoke what was the general sentiment of the day. Women were seen as an inferior to men, intellectually, physically, and morally. But in the Gospels, we see Jesus actively working against the norms of patriarchy. As he traveled from town to town, Luke tells us that a group of women traveled with Jesus. And this may not mean much to us in the modern world, but this was shocking in Jesus' day. For women to to travel with a group of non-male relatives was seen as scandalous. And to include women in his inner circle of disciples was unheard of in the ancient world. Just a few chapters after the text that was read this morning, in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, um, Luke tells us a story about Jesus who visited a sibling group. You know them as Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They were some of Jesus' best friends. And as he spent time in their home, he began to instruct his disciples. Martha was making food so that everyone can eat. Lazarus was there listening in on the teaching and training, and so was Mary seated alongside her brother at Jesus' feet. At one point, if you know the story, Martha comes out from the kitchen to complain to Jesus so that he can tell her sister, Mary, to join her in doing the work. Now, culturally, we tend to read this story and we say, oh, I totally get it. No one wants to do all the work by themselves. Can I tell you, culturally speaking, that's not why Martha was upset. She wasn't upset because she was being left to do all the work. She was upset because Mary had placed herself among the disciples. She was upset because Mary was acting like she belonged with the men, which of course she did. Jesus responded to Martha saying, you were worried and upset about many things, but few things are are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. What Jesus is doing is he's defending Mary's desire to be his disciple, and his response indicated that the circle's more than big enough for Martha to join too, if she so chooses. In this morning's text, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Susanna are all named, joining the likes of fishermen and tax collectors to form Jesus' first disciples. Jesus, like the farmer in verse 5, was not afraid to sow seed in unlikely places. 
A few years ago, I was in Vancouver Airport getting ready to board a plane to Toronto. I was doing some work on a committee with our national denomination, and all the committee members were meeting in Toronto. And so as I was standing in line to show my passport and show my ticket before boarding the plane, I was standing beside a good friend of mine from Vancouver who was traveling with me. And as we stood there, we were talking about Jesus. Now, I don't remember exactly what it was that we were saying about Jesus, but after we showed our passport and our ticket, we kind of walked through the gate. We started to make our way down the gangway to get on the plane. And as we made our way down, a woman came up from behind us, tapped us on the shoulder and said, I was listening to everything that you were saying about Jesus, and you've really encouraged me in my faith. We got on the plane, we, we took, our, over, we took our, our, our small baggage, we put it in the overhead compartment, we sat down side by side, me and my friend, and for the next four and a half hours, we talked about all kinds of things, but one of the chief subjects was, again, Jesus. When we landed, we grabbed our bags, we made our way off the plane, again, up the gangway, and as we did, another person who was seated a few rows behind us tapped us on the shoulder and said, I was listening to what you were saying about Jesus, and I was challenged to maybe receive him for the first time. And later that night, as I settled in my hotel room, the thought hit me, I wonder who else was listening. See, most farmers know the quality of their soil. They know where to scatter because they know where it will bear fruit. The difference between that farmer and us is that we don't know what is going on in a person's heart, whether it's hard or fertile soil. And so, like the farmer in Jesus' parable, we should scatter seed everywhere we go, talking about Jesus indiscriminately, everywhere and with everyone, because we never know where a seed is going to plant and bear fruit. Let's move on and briefly consider the second heart and its response. In verses 6 and 13, Jesus refers to what I'm going to describe as the fragile heart. These are people who hear the good news concerning Jesus. Initially, they embrace the news, but they fall away when things become difficult. When my wife and I first moved to North Vancouver and, uh, and, and moved into our home, we, we were met by two towering trees in our backyard. There was a massive Douglas fir and a mighty hemlock. And in those first few winters, I learned the difference between these two different kinds of trees. The Douglas fir has roots that drill down deep into the soil, while the hemlock's roots are just under the surface and they spread out in every direction. And so in the North Shore, wind and rain where I live, both trees behaved predictably. The fir swayed back and forth but remained rooted and solid. The hemlock was a different story. And so at one point, we crawled in an arborist, a a tree expert, and he told us that the hemlock's roots were too shallow. It wasn't going to last, and he advised us, cut the tree down before it falls down and destroys your house. Some people are like Douglas firs, and other people are like hemlocks. And the question is, when it comes to your life in Christ, How deep do your roots go? Some people are only interested in Jesus for what they can get out of him. Now, to be fair, we're all interested in Jesus for what we can get out of him because he has everything that we need, love and forgiveness and strength and wisdom. But the difference between a hemlock heart and a Douglas heart comes down to the roots, how deep they go, and whether we want what Jesus gives without it costing us anything. I think most of you here in the room this morning would agree with me when I say that we live in a pleasure-oriented society. And the the undergirding thought is that if it doesn't feel good, how could it possibly be good for me? And so we want our medicine to taste like bubblegum. We want to lose weight, but without diet 
or exercise. We want to succeed without difficulty. We want transformation without effort. But anything worth doing is hard work. Completing a university degree, building a career, or a healthy marriage or friendships. It's all hard work. Now, we live in a democracy in the West, and we're not accustomed to being told what to do. And so we elect our government officials, and if they don't do what we want, we simply vote them out at the next election. One pastor writes, our culture is based upon a rejection of the divine right of kings, but for the Christian, God remains on his throne. The idea that God would interrupt our agenda, our will, and seemingly trample upon our rights by asking us to do something, anything, is deeply troubling to the contemporary person. Following Jesus is costly. It will cost you your independence. You cannot live for yourself and live for Christ. If you try, it may appear as though you're growing, but in the time of testing, your heart, your commitment will be revealed for what it is, fragile at best. Let's turn our attention to the third soil in heart response. In verses 7 and 14, Jesus spoke about the thorn-infested heart. These are people who begin to follow Jesus, but as they go on their way, they're choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. And Jesus offers this brilliant image, a seed planted among thorns. This is something that likely all of you have seen as you've made your way in the greater Vancouver area. A thorn bush chokes out the ability of a plant to grow. Now, of course, it doesn't happen all at once. Often, plant and thorn grow up together and they become entangled. And slowly but surely, the thorns act like a boa constrictor and squeeze the life out, making growth nearly impossible. Plants need room to grow. Too much crowding spells disaster. And the human heart is no different. Jesus warns that life's worries, pleasures, and riches functions like a thorn bush. It crowds out God's life and priorities. And before we know it, we're entangled and gasping for breath. If you want to be fruitful, then you need to be somewhat single-minded in the way that you follow God. Allow me to offer an illustration. So my parents' uh, genetics predetermined that I would never, ever be a basketball superstar. Among other things, I'm far too short, and I have a very small wingspan. Now, some of you in this room may have played basketball competitively. I didn't, but I've always been an avid fan. And at the time I was growing up, there was no bigger name in basketball than, of course, Michael Jordan. So I've got a, a picture on the screen behind me. This was a really famous poster. Many of my friends had it plastered on their bedroom wall. And it's simply entitled Wings. And it's meant to draw attention to Michael Jordan's wingspan. So just for some comparison, if you were to take a, tab, a tape measure and measure me from fingertip to fingertip, my wingspan stands at five feet eight inches long. By comparison, Michael Jordan's wingspan stands at six feet, 11 and a half inches. Michael, or sorry, LeBron James's wingspan is well over seven feet, and the longest recorded wingspan of any NBA player is eight feet, one inch wide. Isn't that incredible? Now, here's the point I want to make. Everyone can reach so far, but no farther. I want you to imagine with me that when you said yes to following Jesus, it's as though Jesus grabbed you by the hand, pulled you to his side, and the two of you began to walk step by step down his determined path. But over time, you began to notice things that were just on either side of the path. You still wanted to walk with Jesus, but there were these other things that you wanted to be a part of your life. Maybe it was finding a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Maybe it's being successful in your chosen area of work. Maybe it's amassing wealth and pleasure. It, it doesn't matter what it was, but as you walk with Jesus, you begin to notice these things and you begin to stretch and strain in order to get them. Remember, all of us can stretch so far, but no further. And over time, 
In order to get the one, you have to let go of the other. So here's my question for all of us this morning. Are you clinging to Jesus and keeping in step with him, or are there things that you're reaching for that are putting a strain on remaining anchored and rooted in him? Let's turn our attention to the fourth kind of soil in heart response. Jesus spoke about the fruitful heart. The seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Let me ask you, when you arrive at the end of your life and you reflect upon all of the years that God has given you, what do you think will stand out as being particularly important? My dad was over a number of years ago. Uh, it, it was a Saturday afternoon, and we were talking about the things that we consider important and how those things change over the years. And he said to me, Mark, in nearly every conversation I have these days, do you know the one subject that never comes up any longer? What's the one thing, Mark, that no one ever asks me about? And I didn't know. And so I said, Dad, what does no one ask you about anymore? And the answer he gave me was work. He said, for 50 years, I worked in a profession and was really good at my job. And no one ever asks me about my work. Instead, they want to hear about my family. They want to hear about my friendships. They want to hear about faith. The things that matter most in life. And that conversation with my father stirred something in me, and it got me thinking about the importance I place on things that are transient. In my last moments on earth, how many people do you think are going to want to talk with me about how many churches I pastored, or how large the churches were, or what kind of a car I drove or how expensive my house was. I suspect no one's going to talk with me about any of those things. How do we evaluate whether we're living life well now, instead of waiting until we get to the end of life in order to determine the quality? Here, in our parable, Jesus offers us a target. We're meant to hear his word, grab hold of it, and then with perseverance, follow. As we do, our lives will bear fruit that point to the glory and the goodness of Jesus. All of you here this morning have, have experience of a God who's led you, um, led you through life. He's given you skills and talents and passions, each of which make you a gift from God to others. And gifts are meant to be given. Your life is meant to be given to God for his purposes in the world. Apart from God, there's only one thing that will last for all of eternity, and it's people. We're meant to invest our lives in people. The word legacy gets thrown around an awful lot, and so much so that it actually frustrates me. <laughs> I believe the most important things that we leave behind live on in the people that we have loved, served, and pointed to Jesus. In the end, everything else fades away. Everything. God is present in our midst this morning to love us, to forgive us, to heal us, but he's also here to shake our lives up, to reveal our false attachments so that we can be more fully his. And it's Jesus' presence by the Holy Spirit that makes the fruitfulness God describes possible. As I conclude this morning, I want to ask, if you were to invite Jesus to transform one part of your heart today, what would you ask him to transform? Or if you were to ask Jesus to remove one barrier or a set of thorns that are keeping you choked and gasping for breath, what would you ask him to remove? I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as I pray. Lord, 
we are grateful that your word is powerful. You describe it as being like a double-edged sword that can get past all of our defenses and arguments, and it, it, it can cut right to the heart of the matter. And we pray today, Father, that once again, your word would do just that that it would cut past all of the baggage and barrier, that it would reveal what we're holding on to that's holding us back. And we pray, Holy Spirit, for the grace to let go of these attachments that we might hold firmly to the hand of Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you are loving and forgiving and strong. We thank you that you are wise and you know how to direct us as we make choices and navigate through this life. It's our desire to offer our lives to you that we might be fruitful, that we might represent you well wherever we go and in everything we do. And so, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we submit to you once more. We pray for the strength to, to walk in step with Jesus. We pray all of these things in his name. Amen.